Carl. Michael, what's your middle name? Ernest. Michael Ernest Kitsis. Let's get after it. Wow, I I haven't <laughs> gotten that since I was probably in trouble for something. I know. Five years Thank ago. Carl Richards the third. That's what I. That's the voice I hear in my head. Wow, it like that's it's very <laughs> shrill. Like that was very it was very targeted. Oh, David Carl Richards the third. That's my mom. Ooh. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, so, like, speaking of, um, it's terrible. Like, so, speaking of, you know, being shrill at people. Um, so we, so we kicked off last podcast episode with a tweet you lobbed out to the world. So I want to kick off today's with another one. Wow. Because I know you have this occasional tendency to say things for the sake of just being provocative and well and to be fair sometimes you say it to be provocative and sometimes you say it because you really mean it and i can't always tell (laughs) in a good way which is which so so you lobbed another one of these out there that i want to talk about today let's do it it sounds great so th- this was actually, uh, uh, I think, like a, a month or two ago. I can't remember quite when it blew by on the, on the Twitter feed. But the comment you made, I guess directed more out to consumers directly, was if you're scared about the markets, call your advisor. If your advisor makes you feel dumb for being scared, find a new one. Just kind of very speaking to consumers and simultaneously very in your face to advisors. So like, let me even just ask like, where are you going with this one? Yeah, I was really frustrated. Um, Really frustrated with this, uh, this, uh, you know, you see it in, um, you see it in a, you see it show up in a lot of places there there's it it feels to me like we're developing a little bit of a um a smugness as we learn about behavioral finance which is really good right like we got a whole bunch of people doing amazing work daniel crosby is one of my favorite like seeing like doing amazing work around brian Poit- portney's book right like uh, amazing work around the importance of behavior as we learn more about this, there's this little, this little, we got to just be careful of this little tendency, because I certainly have it and have to check it, is to be like, oh, look at those dumb little humans making their dumb little mistakes, right? Like, and, and the people we're pointing at are our prospective or current clients. And we just, and I know we would never say it that way. Like, we would ne- not anybody listening to this, this would, you know, like some people in the industry might, but. We would never mean it that way, but there can be this little smugness that creeps in when, we, when we're sort of like, oh, look how smart I am. I know all about behavioral finance. And we forget that's just humans acting like humans act. And we, by the way, right, like, I don't know what my blind spots are, but I know I have them. And uh, so I, that, that's, where, well, that's where it came from. Where I was going with it was just like, actually, what I was really trying to get at is hey, let's insert a little humanity and mainly empathy into how we treat our fellow humans whom we happen to call clients when they get nervous about money. You, you have a, I, and I have to admit, I, th- I think you have a, a real point uh, around this and kind of the, the just, don't they have to look surprised? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, yeah, yeah. Did uh, he just say that? Like, <laughs> to that? For those who are just listening to the podcast, like he actually had a look of surprise on his face when I said I agree with them. Put, uh, put that on the, the toot machine, which is what I call Twitter. I, I, I think, I think part of the problem, frankly, is that we're we're kind of trained this way, and and I, frankly, sure. I think. Although I love the research itself, I actually feel like all the research we're doing in behavioral finance is making this problem worse. Yeah. Yep. Because the way we frame it in the world of behavioral finance right now is 
human beings have all these behavioral biases that we're here to to solve, to correct, to keep them from doing, which is almost literally like what we're teaching is your clients are biased and dumb and your job is to make them not do dumb things. I mean, sometimes we literally say like, my job is to keep you from doing dumb things. You can't more directly set up the implied judgments that what your clients are doing is dumb and start turning that into a power dynamic or a belittling thing. And uh, granted, we haven't been through an extended bear market for a long time, but as I think back to prior bear market cycles, like, yeah, I think reflecting back on myself even, yeah, you know, when you're going through one of those tough market scenarios and you're having like the 17th conversation with a client this week about the same scary thing that happened totally. and it's the same conversation and the same aggravating stuff and you're trying to make the same talking points to get them back to dial down and not be so freaked out. Like, I think it's hard to have that conversation over and over again with clients and not get to a point of like, oh my God, this like, this is aggravating. This is dumb. Like, oh, why can't they just see? Seriously? And seriously, another one? Like, like yeah, to- to- and I think this would be a good place for us, for me at least, to feel like, look, I want to insert a little empathy here for the people who are watching. Like, I get it, right? Like I- that description, 17th time, all like don't you trust me like I, we've had this conversation go back to knitting or riding your bike i got this like those feelings those are all natural too like this natural tendency for us as we learn about behavioral finance stuff to 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 want to point it out that's a natural tendency and I, and i think we just have to spend a little more time everywhere understanding what we're doing like like something as simple as think of what you're requiring of somebody when they they have a they come into you as a prospective client they come to you and they've got a portfolio they think it's a portfolio you know it's a smorgasbord right like a collection of investments they think it's a portfolio every one of those every single line item on that statement somebody made a decision and, 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 you know, and it's particularly if you're dealing with a, a couple where there may even be some like blame or shame around the decisions that were made. And you're going to go in and say, I'm going to summarily sort of execute all of those decisions by selling it and putting in this new portfolio. Like uh, even there, like we just have to, I, I'm, I'm, I'm finding myself saying this a lot lately. Like I get it. And that's how an advisor could handle it is saying, Hey, I told, I want you to know something. Like I even have, I have a sketch that says like advisor, you know, and in the middle is like big mistake. And on the other side is client. And like, I, I've written that, like one of your jobs is to be the thing between you, your clients and the big mistake. Yeah. So like I've, I've, we do this, we get it, we get it. And I think what the language around it needs to just simply be one of empathy And I found my, and we can only do this if it's true, because that's another rule of real financial advisors. We only say things that are true. But I've just found a little statement, like, just, so here's how I'd handle that. Client calls, 17th call, around scary whatever. Oh my God, the the thing, the CNBC News, the headline, the market's down 3% today. It was down seven last week. Oh my God, the world is ending. Ooh. Carl, save me. Yeah. And it, it, Actually, it sounds- no, it's probably more like, Carl, it's your fault. <laughs> I gave exactly you my money that. and it's down 10% in two weeks. That was almost a perfect reenactment, right? Like that's how it can sound. It's, it yeah. may even say that, but that's how it sounds. I think we just need to learn to take a big pause and understand two number one i I think there's like three steps to this but let's just cover one and two number one is absorb with empathy right like i call this the scary markets conversation right but it can happen with happy it can happen with happy markets it can happen with cash flow whatever client scared we're using the example here market activity financial pornography network is yelling at people the circus clown saying bye bye sell sell they're all calling you 17th time michael just gave us a great role play i would just take a deep breath and say hey michael i understand in fact this is the line i always used in fact 
if I watch the news and focus on it for very long, I can feel that way too. And you're only allowed to say that if it's true. But for most of us, I think that is a reasonable thing to say. If I focus on it, I get scared too. Right? That's just absorb with empathy. It's your job. I used to get mad about this and like you, like sarcastic and a little frustrated. Yeah. Right? But particularly then, because you know, it, it's the first conversation from them to me. It's the 17th conversation from me to uh, yeah, yeah, a freaky yeah, client, yeah. right? Like there's, there's a, the repetition piece from our end, I find, yeah. makes, it, makes it harder because the conversation gets really old really fast. Yeah. And it's I, just the same, the same pattern of the same thing, freaking about the same stuff in the totally. same way oh I like totally, it just I, it gets it gets frustrating like I, for christ's totally. sake i told you not to worry about this thing like we've had this conversation repeatedly we do it like once or twice a year or like yeah. yeah i i get it and here's here's what i just think i just hope that we can do right that there's that wonderful space that victor frankel talked about the space between stimulus and the response and i'm just hoping we can find a little bit of that space for people and realize like this is kind of like you kind of got to gird yourself for it prepare for it like after the third call you may have to just go okay man i, I got it i got to be ready for this and i think we use that space to allow people to feel heard they don't really actually want you to solve the problem they just want a hug and i know they're not saying that but they just want somebody to be and i think if we can just use that space to be empathetic and realize They've been thinking about this for hours, if not days, before they called you. They know what you're going to say. Right? They know they're going to be in a little bit of trouble. They know. So if, if I used to have this client, her name was Martha. She would call every month with something she was scared about. And at like sixth or seventh month, I got a little frustrated. And then like the eighth month, I realized what a blessing it is that she has someone to call. And what a sacred opportunity it is, a sacred trust it is, that I'm the one she calls. And turns out she pays me for that, to be the release valve for other people's anxiety. And so I think if we can just pause, that's the tweet, right? If we can just pause and be empathetic and say, hey, I get it. I understand why you feel that way. I, like when I watch the news right now, I get nervous too. And then there's a whole series of conversations, right? We, what we want to do is take them out of the, which we don't have time to go into now, but take them out of those, the branches. Because they're calling about the market, the economy, and or a product, right? They're pointing at a specific investment vehicle on the, in the account that you manage for them saying, look at that thing. We want to take them out of that and pull them back to the roots, which is like the why, the reason they're planning, their goals, right? So we just... I, I just think the important part here is we hear you. I hear you. I'm here for you anytime you need a hug because it's 17 times. Like, call Michael or I. We'll give you a hug too. Like, we know it. But can we just, could we just infuse the world with a little more empathy for the human on the other side of that phone call that's so worried? They're so worried that they had the guts to pick up the phone and call you because they know what you're going to tell them. Yep. They're that worried. And they just want a hug and then they want you to remind them of the rationality of the plan you built. But only, we can't just throw reason, rationality at them. Right now, they're irrational. What do you want in, when you're feeling irrational? You just want empathy. Yeah. So well, beautiful. But, you know, the, the other thing this reminds me of in, in sort of the, this theme of having more empathy and just trying to better understand where, where they actually are kind of mentally in, in potentially freaking out about markets. Uh, you know, this, this was driven home for me early on by a, a client actually we were working with all the way back in the, the like 2000, 2002 market decline who I'll say like, <laughs> I was going to make up a name for her, but I think I could actually just call her Rachel because that was her name and it was 17 years ago. So she probably won't be listening to this. Uh, Rachel had a, an $800,000 portfolio. It was down about 15% that year. Uh, 
So she was down like $120,000. And, and I remember the number because the max contribution limit at the time on 401k plans was, I, I think we were like right at $12,000. And basically she had lost 10X her annual contribution. And so the problem that cropped up that I didn't realize until the conversation unfolded, I was sitting second chair at the time, so this was good because I couldn't have unpacked this. Like, she was freaked out, really freaked out about the market decline. And what it eventually came down to was not even I lost 15%. It wasn't even that I lost $120,000. It was... I lost the last 10 years of mm -hmm. all of my hard work and saving, right? She'd kind of dissociated what frankly had been a monstrous amount of growth she had in the late nineties as the, as the portfolio ran out because she'd been with the firm for a while. And her experience, the market decline was not a percentage loss. It was not a dollar loss. It was an everything I've worked to save for 10 years just vanished. Mm -hmm. And that's what was freaking her out because she was now projecting forward, I'm going to have to work 10 more years until I'm 70 something to make up what I've lost, yeah. which was not entirely even connected to her actual retirement projections reality. Uh, but just it, it really struck me that it wasn't the market decline for her directly she translated that without any conversation or suggestion from us like she translated that in the 10 years of trying to live frugally and get raises and and be a good saver and she felt like she watched 10 years of hard frugal living go up in smoke mm. and that was what actually set her off and, and it was only a conversation we got to because of uh, the advisor. And I, like, I wish I could remember exactly what he said now. Um, he had a more delicate way of putting it, but it was essentially something the effect of, it, it seems like you're even more upset about this than just mm -hmm. the decline itself. Like, I understand you've lost a significant amount of money, but like, the portfolio has also gone up a lot more of this not so many years ago. Like, why is this hitting you so hard? Yeah. And, mm -hmm. right, and obviously you have to be careful about how you say that, that you don't just, like, belittle their feelings. Like, why are you freaking out on me? Like, he, he had a good way of putting it, but he kind of highlighted this, like, it seems like your reaction to this is even stronger than just the amount of money you lost. Like, is there something else going on here? And that yeah. was how we eventually got to this. I've just watched 10 years of trying to be a frugal liver. all go up in smoke that had set her off. And just it, it, it was a striking thing to me, both, you know, a, sometimes we don't even realize what clients are, mm. are anchoring to what like the the lens by which they're viewing a market decline you can't always assume it's just they're looking at the portfolio decline from a to b and that the only way to get to the underlying meaning was to acknowledge and lean in to yeah. say like not to say what like hey you need to take it down you're really upset but he went the opposite direction he leaned into it, it was like you are really upset. Like I can see that you're so upset. Like just help me understand why this is so upsetting to you. Yeah. And that was how the conversation came forward. I listen, I that's such a beautiful example because I don't I mean like I can feel like how could you not sort of want like like I I think what happens a lot with uh, with us advisors is we may not recognize it as this, but we feel like maybe there's a little bit of like a threat. Like it's your fault. You know, like we need to, and, and yes, therefore yes. we 
we need to be defense. We need to def- I don't mean defense. It comes. It can come across as a defensive, but I almost mean like we need to defend, like you would in a debate. Like we need to defend what's going on. And 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 what I what I think and and like you know you even pointed out like you know it wasn't necessarily tied to your projections and that like you, there's plenty of places where you could quickly have gone to be defensive about the advice that you'd given and I think that's kind of what we feel but I think if if that's that's ration that's that's being rational and reasonable and throwing facts and figures at somebody first wow right like. Help me understand this has really got you worried and upset. I, I, there's always, there's almost always a, a, a reason behind the reason. Yeah. And I think if we can just, like, how can you not, the way you just described that, how can you not feel humanity there? Like, of course you're worried. Oh, oh I get it now. I'm sorry. That must have been, that's been tough. Right? Like, when I look at stuff, like, in fact, even right now, I can feel it. Right? And, then, and then we can circle back to, like, thanks for sharing that with me. Like, thanks for trusting me, frankly, enough to have this conversation. Right? So, and, and that's the hug. And then, then, of course, we can carefully circle back, which we should talk about in another episode when we get time to do it. Because it would be way too long here because it would be triple what we've already spent. But we can circle back to, like, okay, from here where? Yeah. Like, how now do we start having – because just remember, when somebody's feeling irrational – and I, I don't mean that pain and fear is irrational, but if you want to blow out of a well-designed portfolio because of market volatility, it's probably an irrational decision. And, and when you're feeling irrational, the last thing you want, try it with a teenager, try it. The last thing you want is somebody to reason with you. So, so as we wrap up, I, I, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, I think, dive into a future, on a future episode, like, as you put it, you, what's the whole conversation to get them out of the branches and try to talk them back down but i i think to wrap up like i would love to hear just a little bit more from you of of how like how do you try to set up this conversation like what's what's the first empathy statement empathy line like thing that just starts down this path because i think you're right like my gut response like either a I need to defend myself because if I acknowledge they're losing money, I'm going to invite them to sue me <laughs> or, right. or be like, let me pull out my chart book with 17 facts and figures about why this is not so bad. Right. Like those are my go-to responses. I think yeah. for a lot of us. So like, what's the first thing I should be trying to say? What's the first conversation? What's the first yeah. you know, empathy moment I should be trying to create? if I'm going to not fall into my usual bad habit of what I would otherwise do with, with my chart books or my defense, defend myself thing. Yeah. And that's, that's what we all do. It's what I do. It's what, it's just natural. Right. But I think what we want to try and do is just remember what it feels to be human and just simply say, Michael, it sounds like it's been tough. Like, I, like I, I want you to know, like, and only if this is true. Again, and, right? and when they say like you're damn straight, it's tough. I'm down a hundred thousand dollars. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I, it doesn't have to be a long moment. Like the moment you described could have been a longer thing. Like, tell me a little bit about what's going on behind. You seem re- like I understand why you're worried, but there seems to be something more here. Can we, can we talk about it? Like that could be a longer one. But now you're pointing to like the businesswoman or businessman that calls like, yeah, damn straight, I'm down a hundred thousand dollars. That could be a shorter moment. It could simply be. Yeah, I get it, man. You know, a little bit more direct, a little bit more drill sergeant Like, like I get it. Yeah, it's it. The market when I turn on the news right now, it's scary. So let's talk about it a bit. Like, tell me what has you worried? Well, the economy, the market. I saw Jim Cramer yelling, the circus clown, and da, 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 like, and you you get a little. Okay, got it, got it. And then then you use, which we'll get into more. Step number two. Step one is absorb with empathy. Step number two is use the please hold method. You got to use the please hold method. So right there with, especially with businessman, businesswoman. Yeah. Yeah. I'm down. You're in there. I got it, man. Totally got it. I understand. Like it's, it's scary right now. And especially if you're watching the news, which we all do, we live in DC. Obviously we watch the news. Like I, I get it. You're nervous. Can you give me a second? I want to run, grab your file. 
that is the ultimate ninja trick. And we're going to have to get into it in another call. But what you're doing is just trying to create a little bit of space. They made the tough phone call. They're in full flight or fight. They've done the hardest part, which was pick up the phone and call you. You have, boom, taken a punch to the face and you just need to regroup. Can I get your file? And what you're doing is you're like, I know your cute little computer's already pulled up all their contact, but you still say, please hold. You can do it in person. They came in, you didn't expect it. They punched you in the face with the market. You can say, oh, I wasn't prepared. Like I understand what you're concerned. I wasn't, let me go grab some, some notes that I left in the, just get yourself 30 seconds. Give them 30 seconds. It's all it takes. Come back. And then when we come back, we're going to say, okay, got it. Understand, worried. Can we, can we do it? Before we get into that, let's just real quickly, let's back up. And let's sort of just real quickly, I want to just check on a few things. When we first met, you told me, right? And we go into like values, goals. We reconfirm all those things. We go all the way up to, then we build a portfolio based on that. And then we get into the longer conversation. Okay. So it's just absorb with empathy, create a little space, reconnect to why. I love it. I love it. So I will good. try it the next time our inevitable bear market <laughs> comes because we're 11 years into a bull market. So it's only a matter of time now. Yeah. The please hold method. Okay, Michael. Method. Awesome. Well, thank you, Carl. Thank you. We'll talk soon. Absolutely.